Here we go live tonight, y'all. Method of the Coaches, number 68. The Game Changer, Friday Night Live. Living Branches of Christ. Pizza Vine, Winter Branches. John 15, 5. Hope y'all had a good day today. We've had a fantastic day. Ourselves, Sandra and I have a real grateful for uh, my wife and her uh, achievements by God's grace. 23 years today, 23 years today by the grace of God. We are excited about it and she is too. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. I'd like to say this, we got on YouTube, we got uh, number 51 through 67 on YouTube with the exception of 55. So I'm really excited about tonight, uh, one of my favorite readings in the Bible, John chapter 8, if anybody wants to follow along with us. So the message of the coaches in simplicity is growing into maturity. We grow by our willingness, which is a deep desire, to face and rectify mistakes and convert them into assets. And that's what all coaches do. They review them, they go over them with the players, and, and at the end of every practice, at the end of every game, they, uh, they try to convert those mistakes into assets. And if we convert all our mistakes into assets, a message of hope, how many assets Will we have, I'm going to say, countless. I know I would have countless, but I heard a man say this a long time ago. Smart man learned from his own mistakes, but a wise man learned from everybody's mistakes. So here's our foundation slide. We're going to go ahead and bounce through it real quick so we can get on into our presentation. In simplicity, we want this nature of darkness to go down. From inside us, and we want the nature of light to increase. So, we start off our presentation with a prayer that's recorded in Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. So, we're going to pray to the God of peace. I'm going to pray this for all of us. Now, may the God of peace equip you with all you need for doing His will. May He produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing. That is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. And I'd like to say this any success any of us may be having is far greater his success than ours. So here's what I also like to uh, point out that God always provides our needs. Our wants may never be satisfied, but our needs are all make ways met. That's what I believe. So all scripture is inspired by God, and that's why we use this scripture coupled with the method of coaches so we can take our own inventory and not be taking everybody else's inventory. All scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to teach us what is true, a journey into the truth, and to make us realize, which is spiritual awareness, make us realize how the nature of darkness operates, and how the nature of light operates. Make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It, meaning the scriptures, corrects us, or really, God corrects us through the Spirit, through the Word. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And I always like to say this, right action is the key to good living. And when we want to seek, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else will fall in place, Matthew 6, 33. And we just encourage people to seek to do the next right thing. Live in the moment and just seek to do the next right thing. God uses it, meaning the scriptures, to prepare and equip. That's what we pray for. We pray for equipment. His people to do every good work. And I'd like to say this as a message of hope to all of us. First Corinthians 2, 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard. No mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him who are called to hope according to his purpose. But I want to say this. God's plan is far more superior and greater than our plans. So we're going to ask God right now 
We're going to have a moment of silence and do the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done one day at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to say this. This, been, this has been coming through my mind a whole lot, and I, have, I haven't said it much here lately, but the more we fight to try to have our own way, the worse matters get. I just want y'all to think about that, and we have no peace trying to fight to try to have our own way. So we learn how to live and let live. We learn how to let go and let God. And we learn how to concentrate on what we need to be doing instead of focusing on whatever body else is doing are not doing and we want to know the difference between the things we can do something about and the things that we absolutely can do nothing about. So they just had a big festival, John chapter 7. I probably should have done that before I did this, but I didn't. We just jumped on into John chapter 8. So Jesus has been to the big festival and then he returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered around, gathered, and he sat down and talked to them. So I just want y'all to visualize the scene. He's got a crowd of people around him, and he's sitting there teaching them and showing them what he's been uh, shown by the Father, because he said that. Of myself, I can do nothing. The Father does the work, and he says, me and my Father are at work at all times. As he was speaking, so just visualize the scene and visualize this interruption and think about it. I want you to really look at this. I visualized this scene and how embarrassing it was for that woman. The teacher of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Now visualize that. And I also wondered, I wonder why they didn't bring the man in too. He was just as guilty as the woman was. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I just want y'all to be able to visualize the scene. Jesus is teaching, and then here they come. But they're always trying to trap him because they are angry with him because he's coming against their teachers. So they said, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses said to stone her, what do you say? Here's the wisdom of God and, and Jesus meeting people where they are. But what's in other people's heart? There's a lot of people that want to stone people or want to uh, cast them out or whatever the case may be. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. And here's what I want to say. If I say something that's inadequate or not right, y'all just disregard it. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, test everything you hear, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. But I hope and pray that I don't, but if I do, God knows how to make it right. So temptation, traps, are always being set for not just Jesus, but for all of us. Y'all just think about that. We're all, the, the emotional booby traps are always being set. So the motives were not right. It didn't matter about the woman or the embarrassment for the woman or maybe her family or whatever the case may be. It was about trapping Jesus. They just wanted him to say one thing. You hear it all the time. People isolating cases and disregarding everything else with one isolated case. They kept demanding an answer. So just visualize the scene. What do you think about it, Jesus? What do you think about it, Jesus? What do you say? We're supposed to stone this woman. What you going to say about it? He stood up again and said, All right. But let the one without sin cast the first stone. 
They stood up again and said, I, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. So evidently, he stood up and he sat back down and then he stood up again. Then he stooped down again and rode in the dirt and the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So I'm going to say it again. I'm going to go back to this. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? And I'm going to ask you a question. What do you say about the ones who may have wronged you? Think about that. And how many people have you wronged? Think about that. They were trying to trap him and saying something they could use against him, but he stooped down and he rode into dust within his fingers. And here's my vision of it. Here's the way I visualize it. It's the reason I wanted to go back to it. Because what I believe he did is he stepped, stooped down, started writing in the ground. Whatever he wrote, I don't really know. And I don't, th don't think it really matters. But what I believe he said is, how do you want me to handle this one, Dad? And the Spirit of God told him, to just get up, son, and tell them that the one without sin cast the first stone. They kept demanding an answer. He stood up again and said, all right, I'll let the one without sin cast the first stone. I don't know if y'all remember that uh, old Joe South song that says, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. We'll go ahead and look. when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. You know why? From the oldest to the youngest, because I believe they were all guilty, at least in their thoughts and maybe in their action. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? If they would have get condemned her, they'd have been condemning themselves. So he had them cold turkey. No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. And here's what I believe about forgiveness. I believe if we ask, God will certainly forgive our sins as far as the east is to the west and remember them no more. It said that in Psalm 103. It also said it again in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10. And what I believe is we have to learn how to depend upon God's perfect forgiveness. Now I'm going to ask you this. If somebody wronged you and the Lord hadn't condemned them and has forgiven them, who are we to hold an axe over their head? That's just food for thought. So we have to learn how to depend upon God's perfect justice. We have to learn how to depend upon God's perfect forgiveness and learn how to depend upon God's perfect love if we want to be spiritually healthy. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, So now he's going back to his meat. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, I will say this, that's a big deal, and that's a big word right there. I don't want to be just a so-called Christian. I want to try to follow Jesus' example and meet people where they are. You won't have to walk in darkness. I've walked in darkness for a long time. I've walked with them crutches. Today I'm walking without those crutches by the grace of God. And I know a lot of y'all are too. Because you will have the light that leads to the light. So we want to let the lower lights be burning and send a gleam across the way. There's an old song that says, Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling sea money. You may rescue, you may save, but it's not our light, it's his light. And we don't want to walk in darkness, we want to walk in the light. The Pharisees replied, You are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. I know so many people that know that he is the father and we are his children and we're supposed to be about daddy's business. And people that a lot of people that I know of and dearly love and have known from an early age 
have, have been walking with the Father and helped so many people because the light was shining in them. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make I make them about myself for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know this about me. So they didn't know Jesus' heart because they were just judging from a, a legalism, a, a Pharisee perspective because of what they've been taught and how they've been trained. But the truth of the matter is, intellectually they knew the scriptures, but they didn't have that love relationship with the Father of life, and they don't even know it. See, just like me and a whole lot of people I know, worldly-minded, spiritually ignorant. You judge by human standards. I want to say this about judging by human standards. Social distinctions, social distinctions, petty rivalries, jealousy. So many people look at race, creed, or color. Who wants us to judge by human standards? I can tell you this, with all my heart, with every fiber of being I got in me, it is not God. But I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. So when you get reborn, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit enters our heart and begins to live. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, they're witnesses. Their witness is accepted as fact, as one witness, and my Father who sent me is the other. So Jesus is, they got, a, they got a case going on. Jesus is stating facts, and they're rejecting the facts. Jesus is stating the truth, and they're rejecting the truth. Just like the old proverb, Proverbs 18, 17, said the first presented case in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. And then the facts start being laid out. You know why? Because we want to solve the case. And the only way to solve the case in the spiritual uh, courtroom is in God's courthouse. God's courthouse. Where is your father? They asked. Jesus answered. Since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you would also know my father, but they're not understanding what he's talking about. Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury, but he was not arrested because his time had not yet come. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time for this and a time for that, a time for this and a time for this. And at the appointed time, Jesus came and was born of a virgin. At the appointed time, he went to the cross. At the appointed time, he came up from the grave. At the appointed time, he went back to heaven. And at the appointed time, he's coming back to get us. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Everything. We call it Kairos timing, which is God's special time. Later, Jesus said to them again, I am going away. You will search for me, but will die. In your sin, you cannot come where I am going. That's John 8, 19 through 21. The people ask. So they still looking at it from the worldly perspective. They ain't got the spiritual angle yet. They still looking at it from the worldly angle. Is he planning to commit suicide? What does he mean? You cannot come where I am going. Jesus continued. You are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. That's when the Bible tells us not to conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but let God transform the way you think. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I do, I do not that I let me say this again. I do not I'm going to start all over. Jesus continues. You are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. That is why I said that you will die in your sins for unless you believe. Believe. I believe belief means reliance, not defiance. 
believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they demanded. Jesus replied, the one I have always claimed to be. So the question is, to be or not to be? Part of or part from? I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but I won't. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truthful. But they still didn't understand that he was talking about his Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am He. I do nothing on my own but say only what the Father taught me. And I want to say this. They didn't understand because it wasn't their time to understand. But when they see him lifted up on that cross and all and it gets dark and all this stuff happens and the curtains get torn apart, they gonna know that he is who he is. In Philippians chapter two, it says one day every knee's gonna bow and every tongue's gonna confess that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. There's a whole lot of stuff that we don't understand right now. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will show you the path to take. So, and the one who sent me is with me. He is not deserting me. So God is always with us, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe is what I call it. And I know a lot of people that's walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. And I also know a whole lot of people that don't understand. And there's a whole lot of stuff I don't understand. I don't claim to understand everything. And I never will. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 55, verse 9, that his thoughts and his ways are high above the earth as the heavens are. So learning how to trust in God and learning how to not to fight, to try to have our own way. Learning how to surrender and submit to God is always very beneficial. I don't always do what pleases uh, God, but I do my ultimate bless to try to please Him. And I got Galatians 1.10. And the reason I got Galatians 1.10, it says if you're trying to please people, you are displeasing God. So I don't try to be a people pleaser. I just try to do whatever God puts on my heart to do and leave the results up to Him. Focus on what I need to be doing or not doing instead of focusing on what other people ought to be doing or not doing. I'll tell you this, that was a free and deal, deal for, for, uh, for me. And one of, one of the things that my brother, my younger brother Sid and I agreed on uh, years ago, if we don't take it personal, we don't have to internalize it. Then many who heard him say these things believed in him. So we let God do the speaking. Jesus said to the people, Jesus said to the people who believed in him. I believe that is a big word right here. In Acts 17, 28, it says, In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. You are truly my disciples. So we are going to be the disciples of Jesus, or we're going to be the disciples of the Antichrist. You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And here's what God put on my heart um, when I started this presentation um, uh, several uh, weeks ago. In order for us to be faithful, we got to see where we've been unfaithful. In order for us to be obedient, we got to see where we've been disobedient. In order for us to be disciplined, we got to see where we've been undisciplined. But just seeing it, helps us become aware of it. The game changer is the one who are willing to do something about when they're wrong. That's why the scriptures correct us. You are truly my disciples if you remain 
remain in me and I will remain in you and you will bear much fruit, what it says in John 15. Faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It feels good to be free on the outside, I, on the inside. I believe God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. And I believe that with all my heart. And I, don't, I believe the devil don't want us to be happy, joyous, and free. But if God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free, and I believe he does, whichever fiber being I got in me, then he's going to provide the means and the method for us to do it. Y'all think about that. Happy are you who know these things and do them. That's a quote out of a story that I read. Happy are you who know these things and do them. Happy are you who know the truth. Happy are you who are faithful to God's teaching, at least to the best, uh, best of your ability. And when we're not, His grace fills in the void. Happy are you who know these things and do them. I believe that's a spiritual truth. I also believe that unhappy are you who know these things and choose not to do them, which is the power of choice. So we ask God to grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, our attitude toward life, our attitude toward our fellow man, and our attitude toward our Creator, and wisdom to know the difference between the things we can do something about and the things we can't do anything about. I do my best try to stay out of the plague of grumbling, complaining, and fault finding. I try to focus on my own spiritual demonstration, and I try to stay out of that spiritual plague that's been killing people for a long, long time, all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 4, through the jealousy and the anger and everything. So we want to learn how to accept what it is. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. You can't go back and undo anything you should have done. You can't go back now and, and undo the things that you did or whatever the case may be, and nobody else can either. We learn how to let go of what was, let go, let God, and we learn how to have faith in what will be. So, feed, anger, bitterness, frustration, become. Feed love, joy, peace, patience, become. Become, transmit. Transmit, receive. So if you like the, if you like the fruits you've been taking, your mind, I'm going to say this, your mind is like a garden and your thoughts are the seeds. You can plant flowers or you can plant weeds. But even if you plant flowers, the weeds are going to crop up in your garden. Y'all think about that. Circle of influence, barriers. Who wants those barriers to exist? I tell you this, it's not God. So I want to encourage us all to try to focus on what's good today. Try to have a positive attitude. At the end of the day, I'm going to ask you a question. What kind of transmitter have you been? Have you been focusing on what's bad? Have you, been, have you had a negative attitude? Unhealthy habits. Selfish and inconsiderate habits. Selfish and inconsiderate habits. Just like that old ghost house song, walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. Healthy habits, depending upon God's perfect justice, depending upon God's perfect forgiveness, depending upon God's perfect love. So which kind of transmitter have we been today? I'm going to change that to which kind, of, which kind of transmitter have you been today? And Lynette is watching, so she'll make a note of that. So what we feed our mind or focus on, we become what we become, we transmit, and what we transmit, we receive. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reap what he sows. So whatever nature you sow your seeds in, the nature you're going to reap your harvest in. So what kind of transmitter have we been today? Negative or positive? I've done pretty good today. I don't think I've transmitted hardly any negative Day, at least to my knowledge, but I can't say that for the rest of the week. I've transmitted some negativity. So, what's in your spiritual legend? The nature. We got two natures inside of us, and it, whichever one we feed the most is the one that's going to control and dominate our life. But we want to increase the light, decrease the darkness. We all transmitters. 
We all are either going to transmit something good or healthy, or we're going to transmit something that's uh, evil and unhealthy. He's the vine, we're the branches. As long as we stay connected to him, we're in good shape. John 15, 5. Here's the old thorn bush that the Bible calls a thorn bush. So we want to be positive transmitters. So I'm going to pray this prayer for all of us. And I pray this for every single person. I pray this for everybody on the face of the earth, just to be honest with you. So we're going to ask God, Lord, help us to be positive transmitters. With well, there is hatred, we may bring love. With well, there is wrong, we may bring the spirit of forgiveness. With well, there is discord, we want to bring harmony. With well, there is error, we want to bring truth. With well, there is doubt, we want to bring faith. With well, there is despair, let us bring hope. With well, there is shadows, let us bring light. With well, there is sadness, let us bring joy. So we want to bring this to the table, the spiritual table, and try to help people that's going through this. And so they can transform as we're all transforming together by God's power, God's love, and God's way of life. So instead of being afraid, due to heaven, I'm, I've had to outgrow, I've outgrown some fears this week. And my faith has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. So I'm in pretty good shape right now. Human anger. I've dealt with some human anger this week. And the Bible says in James 1.20 that human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So I got a little prayer that, that I've been saying for over 23 years that I've learned a long time ago. God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Instead of having grudges, we want to have compassion. Herodias had a grudge against John the Baptist in Mark 6, 19 to the point that she got so resentful that she had an opportunity to have half the kingdom from a worldly point of view. You know what she wanted? John the Baptist's head because she didn't know how to surrender and submit, and she didn't know how to give. So instead of being feeling sorry for yourself, we want to have a, a, we encourage people to make a gratitude list. Be grateful for what you got. And don't get caught in the comparing business what other people have or don't have. Just be grateful for what you got. And that's what helped me, that's what helped me get over my hurdle this week. And so God wants us, in the, the old nature of darkness wants us to withdraw, wants us to be lonely, wants us to get in a self-pity dugout. God wants us to have a sense of belonging, of being wanted and needed and loved. And we want to play on this team over here that we're going to show here in a little bit. Instead of having anxiety and frustration, we want to have a peace that passes all understanding. The only way to have it is we've got to be connected to the vine. Instead of being depressed, we want to, have to learn the secret of being content. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, he was in jail. He was in jail. I've been going to jail trying to help people since 1996. I've been going to treatment center trying to help people since 1997. I've been going to prison trying to help people since 1999. And I love those people down there. I love them. I've done I've so much. Uh, I've tried to help them. To, but for the grace of God, I'm in there with them, okay? But Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, he learned the secret of being content. He's in jail. He said, well, the welfare in these, he said, because I can do all things through Christ, who's divine, who strengthens me. And in Philippians 4, 18, he said, at the moment, I have everything I need. So we want to increase the light and decrease the darkness. Personal evaluation, at the core, is personal and simple. So when I started evaluating myself instead of, Everybody else, and see, I didn't know how to evaluate myself, and God worked in a mysterious way to give me a simple formula so I could review my day at night at the end of the day and learn from my mistakes, the power of choice, and it takes discipline to do that. So for a long time, I was a native player representative on this team right here. Under the authority to follow the darkness because I was worldly minded, I looked at everything from the worldly angle, I had worldly eyes, I had a worldly mind, I had worldly ears, and it was all about the world in its way, and it wasn't about the spiritual in its way. So now I try to be the best player I can be. I want to be an agent, and I want to be on this team. And I love being a team player, and I love being around the team members that we got on the team. Together, everyone achieves more. But the same thing happens over here, either darkness or light. So which team? Did I play on in the past? 
which team do I play on in the present, which team will I play on in the future, and the choice is an individual. Same thing on this side. This is evaluation, which team did I play on, which team do I play on, which team will I play on. God is love. God loves his creation. It don't matter what race, creed, or color you are, God loves every human being, and he wants us to be an agent, a player, or representative for him. The old nature of darkness wants us to hate one another, hate one another. But here's a good, healthy, love-hate deal. In Hebrews 1.9, God said that he loved righteousness and he hated wickedness. And what that means to me in simplicity is he hates the nature, but he loves the people. So everything is permissible, so we got free will, but not everything is beneficial, at least on this side. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive, at least not to this side. Nobody should seek his own good, which in simplicity, I suffered from the what about me-ism for a long time, but the good of others, 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24. So God give us the power of choice, and every day we stand at the crossroads. We either seek to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, or we can keep on fighting to try to have our own way. And I'm, and I'm telling you, the more you fight to try to have your own way, the worst matter to get. Are you either going to represent this side over here, or you're going to be a representative for this side over here, and you have no choice in being a representative. So we have to make up our mind whose player we want to be, whose agent we want to be, and whose team we want to uh, play on. Either the father of light or the father of darkness. In simplicity, we want to know who our spiritual daddy is, and at the core, it's personal and simple. So we're going to pray this prayer in. We want to be this and not be this. To be or not to be. So I'm going to pray this prayer for all of us. Lord, help us be patient and kind. Help us not be jealous, boastful, proud or rude. Help us not demand our own way. Help us not be irritable. Help us to keep no record of being wrong. Help us not rejoice about injustice, but help us rejoice whenever the truth wins out. Lord, help us to never give up, help us to never lose faith, help us to always be hopeful, and help us to endure through every circumstance. And I got this Romans 15, 13, where it says, May the God of hope, with the big G, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that your hope may overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as an act of obedience, in every circumstance, endure through every circumstance. First Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, who belong to Christ Jesus. And verse 19 says, Do not put out the spirit spot. So the implication is, if we don't give thanks in all circumstances, then we're running on self-will instead of God's will. And it diminishes our usefulness and we put out the spirit spot. So today is game day. We got a born day. We got a death day. I go to the locker room every day. I go to the locker room before I start my day, and at the end of the day, I go to the locker room again, just like Jesus did. Mark 1.35, before daylight, he went and spent time with the Father. Mark 6.46, at the end of the day, he went and spent time with the Father. I'm going to encourage us all to be strong and courageous, not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. Joshua 1, 9. Just like the Lord our God was with us, He was with Jesus, and He lived inside us. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we have found a way up and out, spiritual liberation and strength, and we wish to share our knowledge of that way with all who can use it. John 14, so we're going to close out with a prayer and we're going to pray that God gives us more and more and more because with God it's a limitless love. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. And so we want to be, we want to know the truth 
so the truth can set us free and we don't want to be sensitive to the truth. So a vision for you, a vision for us. I'm going to go ahead and do this pretty quickly. We want to get rid of this because I, I'm going to do two more prayers at the end. Of one more scripture that's got some prayers on it. We want to increase this side and decrease this side. We want this side to be the dominant force and we want to get rid of that old thorn bush and get rid of those old resentments and those grudges and that anger and that self-pity and the anxiety. We want them to go down. And the Bible says in Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. With man, these are impossible. With the natural man, don't have the ability. But with God, all things are possible. Here's who we are. We appreciate your prayers and support. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to pray this out. This is going to close us out with this prayer, and it's going to be the end of our presentation. I pray this for all of us. I pray that from God's glorious unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Then Christ will make His home in your heart as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down in, into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, our glory to God, who is able, through His mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Take care. Hope you have a good, peaceful evening and a wonderful uh, Saturday and Sunday.